And we're going to be diving into chapter six and chapter seven. Okay. So make sure you have your books in front of you. Uh, chapter six is talking about leaders uh, managing work schedules, employee work schedules in particular. Um, I don't know if you were aware of this or not, but did you know it cost about $2,000 to train an employee? That, that's something to think about, right? So a lot of times I feel establishments will not do proper training just to save the money. They'll throw you in a spot and they'll just, I guess, pray that you catch on and, and that you can do what you can do without proper training. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, the need for effective work schedules. Who can tell me what labor cost is? Raise your hand. I think that's pretty cool. If you can tell me what labor cost is. All right, go ahead, uh, Josh. Uh, labor cost is what the company is having to pay out to be able to actually train you whether uh, proper training or not, then it's at least still training you in a position that you've been hired to do. That is correct. So everybody, please make sure your mic's off unless you're called to speak, okay? Um, labor cost refers to the money, all right? That's not, it, it's, it's your pay. If you're an hourly wage, salary way, well, salary is salary. It's not really a wage, hourly wage or salary, but it also includes any fringe benefits that you may get, such as your um, insurance package or your per diem package or, you know, um, anything like that. So you, that is your labor cost. And managers must, usually there is a budget for this cost. And you have to have an effective schedule so that you can keep in line your work wage and salary and your benefit with whatever is budgeted for that, you know, for your establishment. Um, so with that being said, typically, and if you'll look there, managers must use an effective scheduling process. Um, to determine employees um, what what they need during a service or the hours that they're open, anything like that. Um, the crew schedule is the result of a chart that informs you, all right, of your hours, days, whatever you need to work. That is typically called a crew schedule. So make sure you, you highlight that and you know what that is. Um, now, a crew schedule may not include your salary employees. Why do you think that is? Who can tell me why that is? Robert Swanson, turn your mic off, please, unless you're answering. Um, who can tell me? Hey, Jeff, I have a, Jeff, I have a question. Yes, sir. All right, so you said you and your husband ran a business, correct? Correct. All right, so my question is, how do you tie in the um, the benefit with the um, labor cost? I don't understand how that works. When, so typically most people who have a benefit package, they're going to have what is called a compensation package. So you're going to have in the accounting setup, you're going to have a separate line item for health insurance, uniforms, um, maybe if you get paid time off, all of these are going to be calculated and included in a compensation package. Now, they are included, but they are separate line items from your, let's say, your wage item. Okay. Does that make sense? So you may work for a corporation that supplies you with all of these fringe benefits and provide you a salary. So when they look at your overall compensation package, let's say you may make 75,000 or 100,000 a year, that compensation package is going to include the cost of that health insurance, um, what they've calculated your you know paid time off would be what they calculate your uniform cost would be that's called a compensation package but yet you may only literally make 
let's say 50,000 as far as your salary portion of that package. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna use a minister as well because I used to be the uh, chief financial officer for my church. And a lot of people would say, okay, we're going to budget and we're going to pay a minister. Um, and again, I'm going to use the same scenario, 100000 a year. That's how much the church is going to afford in the, or budget in the compensation package for this minister. And this package, again, is going to include um, his health insurance, his automobile um, expense, his book expense. It's going to include any time off. It's going to, you know, you, you get the drift of what I'm saying. Whatever the church is going to pay for him, that's in that compensation package, as well as his salary, which may only be 50000 or 75000 whatever the money that he's going to report, at, you know, as, as his income on his tax reporting that's his salary amount but a package can include everything else that you're paying for okay um like i mean and, and you can go on and on with that but th there is a difference compensation package is everything that you're budgeting to pay that person a salary a salary or an hourly wage is strictly labor cost Okay. All right. So again, yes, I'm going to pose the question um, on a crew schedule. Why do you not think a salaried employee would need to be on that um, crew schedule? Is anybody on here a salary employee? No. All right. So Patrice, go ahead. Um, is it because the crew schedule is only counting the wages and the salary employees have a compensation uh, package? So, um, you're close now, salaried employees may not have a compensation package. They may just be paid, um, 50,000 a year, but they're salaries. So they're not, they're getting paid a set amount either monthly, bi-weekly, or weekly, whatever that is determined. Just because you're a salaried employee don't mean you have an entire compensation package, okay? It does mean, though, that you're getting a set amount of pay irregardless of how many hours you work, okay? Hourly employees are paid by the hour they work. Sometimes hourly employees are making more than salaried employees, especially in the restaurant industry, okay? Um, because a salaried employee, and I'll give you an example here at school. I'm adjunct. I get paid by the hours that I work. All right. Bottom line, my pay is dictated by the hours that I work. I have no fringe benefits whatsoever. I'm part time. Now, our salaried instructors, our full time instructors, they're getting paid the same amount. All right every week or every bi-weekly, because we get paid bi-weekly, they're getting paid the same amount every bi-weekly, but they may one week work 40 hours a week, next week work 60 hours a week, next week work 70 hours a week, but they're getting, they're locked into that salaried amount, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, okay. Patrice, you froze there. <laughs> you probably can still hear me though. All right, so let's move on. So that's that's the main reason. A crew schedule is typically for your hourly employees. It lets them know what hours that they are working, okay? Um, salaried employees would not be listed on that because they have a predetermined pay that comes along with you know, maybe a stipulation that says you must work 50 hours a week, bottom line. Anything above that, you're not getting paid more. Anything below that, you know, 
um, you're not getting paid less, but they're going to require you to work X amount. Sometimes it's 40 hours a week minimum, whatever. They're going to stipulate that. All right, so there's several steps there that you follow to um, create a schedule. One of them is you got to know your budget, right? As y'all are determining in your projects, you're determining your organizational chart. Remember, for each person on that chart, you're going to have to have a, 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 a budgeted item of what you're going to pay that person in future classes. So that's why I've told some of y'all, be careful. Don't, don't make that chart too big. Um, especially as a startup, because let's say you have owner, um, executive chef. Well, the owner's going to make X amount of dollars, executive chef, X amount of dollars, um, each, each manager, X amount of dollars. And how, who can give me an idea of what managers might make? If you're a manager, what do you expect to make? Oh, I was going to answer that. Um, I was to say, I wrote. Um, and I saw like where you could make from twenty to twenty six dollars an hour. Twenty to twenty six thousand? No, no, like uh, an hour. Oh, twenty to twenty six dollars an hour as yeah. a manager. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, and, and that might be on target if you take that and add that up. Forty hours a week, fifty two weeks a year. Okay. Um, a, a manager can expect to make 40, 50,000 a year, right? Or more, correct? So um, you start adding that up on your organizational chart, you're up front before you ever sell a dime worth of product, you're having to pay those people. So remember that when you're working on your project, you want low overhead when you start up your uh, fantasy fantasy project, okay? All right, so you got to you got to determine your budgeted labor costs. Now there's two ways you can do that. You can kind of go with the national average or if if you've been up and running, you can obviously look at your POS system, correct? POS gives you a lot of information. You got to create a master schedule and we're going to get into master schedule here in a few minutes. Um you got to develop the crew schedule. You got to distribute and adjust the crew schedule. Just because you have an idea of what you want people to work doesn't mean they can necessarily work that. Or you may create a crew schedule and you have a, a slow night. So you're sending people home. So it's, it's learning how to adjust that schedule to meet the needs of your operation. Um, it's monitor the employees during the shifts. Again, if, if you've got people on your shift that are, you know, they're spending more time on their phones than they are working, guess what? That's when you start sending people home. You don't want to do that, but, but they're eating up your dollar budget, your labor budget. Um, and then you have to analyze after each shift. Did you have enough people? Did you not have enough people? Those are things you got to think about as a manager, right? So managers must know the amount of labor costs that has been budgeted. And then you use that to develop the employee schedule. How many of y'all just thought managers just threw up schedules on a whim? They, I hope nobody raises their hand on that because they don't just do it as a whim. They literally have dollars they have to go by and they're trying to maximize those dollars for, for whatever organization they work for or for themselves. Um, now, something I want to share with you, and you can write this in your book. Um, I'm on page 151. We're, we're getting off here. Labor cost is usually about 40%. So make a note there that this is just personal newsworthy. Labor cost is usually about 40% of your budget. All right. So it, it's pretty on up there. You have to watch it pretty closely. And did you know that the average profit margin for a restaurant or a food establishment, the average profit margin is only 3%. So three to 5%. And, and that's, pro I'm, I'm going to say 5%, probably if you're managing your labor cost well, you're managing your food cost well, and, and you've got low overhead. So you need to remember that there's not a lot of room when you start as a manager or owner creating budgets 
there's not a lot of wiggle room for you to just have throwaway monies, right? Um, how many of y'all in first quarter, I, and, and I can't help but think of first quarter, how many of y'all throw away a half a carrot? Yeah, you don't even think about it. Boom, I'm done with it. I'm going to throw it away. Well, in the real world, in the food industry, Krista, I see them eyes going up. <laughs> um, in the real world, that half a carrot costs money. And that could be the difference between you staying open or you closing. You really have to think about that if you're going to think about ownership of a business, okay? And not everybody's going to attend to your money the way you are right? Not everybody's going to really care about your money the way you do. All right. So I'm not going to go too much into it. If you look at fringe benefits, again, that is separate from your wages. Um, they are benefit monies paid directly in support of the employee for the purpose such as what I said, vacation, holiday, sick, health insurance. You may give them a car allowance. You may give them a book allowance, you may give them whatever. Um, that is called a fringe benefit, and that is part of the compensation package, which is different line item from your wage or salary line item, okay? All right, and you can look down there. Um, at the bottom, there is a, um, a little uh, formula there. You can look at the June labor wage budget was 38. So this particular establishment or person had a 38,900 uh, wage budget. Now remember wage is only your crew members, right? Wage, think wage. That is your hourly paid employees. They divided it by 30 days, 30 days in June. And that gave them how much they could put on the schedule each day. So they really could not afford to pay any more than, than that 1297 right? A day. So they couldn't pay anybody else to come on the schedule that day. All right, so we're gonna move on. Um, also, if you wanna look at, if you take, if you flip over to the next page there, they have the average daily wage, all right? Think about this. So. I can spend $1,297 a day on my hourly employees. If my average employee makes $12 an hour, that means for that day, I can only have 12 employees on average. It, it gives you 108. What that does is it gives you $108, okay? And if you divide that out, you can only have about 12 employees on staff that day. So you've got to shuffle that schedule, right? Because you can't go over that. So you got to really think about that when you start putting a schedule together. Now, creating a master schedule. you got to have a master schedule before you have your crew schedule. So make sure you understand this will be on a test somehow, some way. Know the difference between a master schedule and a crew schedule, a master schedule, and they give you a big old example there. I'm not going to go into it. I feel like you can look at it. A master schedule tells you how many people you need when, what time, where, that sort of thing. You've got to know what you need before you can start creating your crew schedule, correct? So to help ensure the correct, the correct number of waged employees, you have to know um, what you need to give your customers prompt service, all right? Efficient service, properly prepared food. If you don't know who you need, when you need, then how can you sit there and decide which employees you need to bring in that day? So you need to create that master schedule before you create that crew schedule. Everybody got that? Thumbs up if you do. Anybody got any questions? You can raise your hand if you got a question on that. There is a difference between the two schedules. Make sure you know that. All right, now we're gonna move on. Let's flip on over to, um, um, let's see. I've already covered that. I'm not gonna go through all these formulas. You can look at seven hours there in the middle of a uh, page uh, 154 seven hours at six dollars an hour 
Typically wage employees, again, they're paid by the hour they work. So keep that in mind. If they work seven hours a day, they're making $6 an hour. Guess what? That's already 42 total wage dollars. Okay. They're, they made 42 wage dollars that day. Now, really, that's not a whole lot of money, but that 42 round off to $50 a day can make or break, right? Between you making money, losing money, if you think about it. So you have to be smart. All right. Now, sales history information. We already know our point of sales, our POS system is a great way to determine and look at and derive reports from to give us insight into our establishment. If you're an up and running business, um, that's great. If you're a starter business, sometimes it's making a sales forecast. You're, you're trying to be as accurate as possible, but you may not be 100% on point, which is why you got to be willing to adjust. All right. You may look at, you know, you may budget a, a dollar amount for a week. And at the end of that week, you're looking at your sales and you're looking at how much you pay and you're like, Ooh, I better um, not call so-and-so in next week. And I know this sounds horrible when you're used to being on the employee side of things and you wonder why you get sent home when you need the dollars. A lot of managers and owners, they get that, but they still have to meet a bottom line dollar. Remember, I, I preached this from day one. Um, you have to be, you, you have to express empathy. You have to be sympathetic. But also you got to remember as an owner or a manager of an establishment, you're in business to make money. If you're losing money, you're not only sending one employee home, you're sending the whole establishment home. Okay. And that's not to say that, you know, there may not be things that you can do. Um, so anyway, sales forecast, um, they, they need to be as accurate as possible and they're critical in developing a good master schedule. So you got to know what's coming to create that master schedule. Uh, past sales records are used as a baseline. All right. Again, POS system. So uh, make sure you look at that. Now, here's some examples of factors that will influence your customer count. It, Again, especially in the restaurant industry, you need to know your customer count, right? You need to know how many people are coming in. You need to know how many on average, cut. well, you need to know how many covers on average, what are your ticket price? We covered that in, last, in some of the last chapters, right? You need to know these things. So holidays, what are some of the holidays? Let's see, who am I going to pick on today? Um, Robert, what's a holiday that might affect yourselves? Robert Swanson. Robert Swanson, are you here with me? All right, let's roll on over to Bradley. Bradley, what are what are some set what what is a holiday that might affect your sales? Christmas. Perfect. Amazing holidays. Perfect. Perfect. Exactly. I, I can't help but think what holidays coming up? Mother's Day, right? It, it, if we weren't in a shut-in situation, how many of you would be flocking to a buffet for Mother's Day? <laughs> you know, you'd be you'd be going, you know, either here. I know here in Eggers, they, oh my gosh, they do over 300 on Mother's Day for Mother's Day buffet. Um, so those holidays affect, uh, yes, Josh. Um, one thing, I don't know if a lot of people have noticed it yet, but Applebee's is actually starting to reopen all of their dining rooms. And I saw that me personally, sign. I may like the food, but I'm still going to wait a while before I actually go into a dining room at a restaurant. Sorry, folks. Right. But hey. right. Some, some are. And again, um, they're probably going to do like we're, we're going to do now. I know Eggers is not going to open, I think, till June. Um, but there are some starting to venture open. And again, I think you have to use your own personal discretion and, and be responsible with what, what you're doing. Now, keep in mind when I say this, the same people prepping that dine-in food are the same people that were prepping there to go. So if you're not a germaphobe and you are already buying takeout, 
I don't think the food's going to be any more contaminated than potentially it was to start with. However, you are increasing your risk exposure when you visit public places. That's all I'm going to say with that, okay? That's my personal take. Don't nobody quote me on none of that. Um, seasonal adjustments, advertising and promotions, community activities and economy, obviously all they, they play a role in your um, in your customer accounts, what can influence your customer accounts. Trends, right? We've talked about trends. Who can tell me the difference between a trend and a fad? Uh, Krista. Yes, sir. What's the difference between a trend and a uh, fad? Uh, a trend is something that sticks around for a little while, and a fad is something that goes away over time. That's right. That's right. So what's an example, uh, Gizmo, of a fad right now? You with me, Gizmo? Yeah. What? What? Give me an example of a fad right now. What was that again? An example of a fad. What is that? Um, you know the difference between a trend and a fad? I don't. Okay. Somebody give me an example of a fad. Help Gizmo out. Keto diet? I want to say probably um, a fad. <laughs> Uh, I mean, in the hair industry, there's a lot of fads like hairstyles that goes in and out all the time. There you go. Um, they got these new, they got these new braids out now called the pop smoke braids, and everybody named grandma getting them, and they, it'll be gone. Just about this, it'll be, it'll be, it's gonna be gone. No. <laughs> I'm so sick of them already. Right, right, right. Okay. Well, I mean, that, that, that's a great example, right? It really is a great example. Something that comes in and goes out, um, and, and I'm old enough to know if you wore it once, don't, don't wear it again, right? Like bell bottoms or mini skirts or things like that. If you wore it once, don't wear it again. Um, but yeah, so trends, I would consider trends in, in the food industry something like farm to table. I mean, it, it was a fad turned into long-term trend. It, it's trendy to go into a, a restaurant, a restaurant to base its service on farm to table. It's still a trend. It, it's something different than the ordinary, correct? But it's something that has stuck around for a long time. Um, but some of these diets like gluten diet, keto diet, whatever, it, if you're putting um, food on your menu that is based around a diet that comes and goes, then that um, that is something that would be a fad, okay? I'm gonna sit here and turn my phone off so it doesn't keep going here. Or no, I'm not, they're still on. So keep that in mind. Um, some of those things play a role. Think about hurricanes, um, damage to vacation areas, all of that's gonna play a role. So I'm not, I'm not gonna go too much deeper into any of that. I think y'all can look at that because um, there's so many things uh, that can affect that from, you know, they, they talk about um, the weather, tourism, all this kind of stuff. So let's move on. Uh, sales projections for a new year. You need to, again, you need to be able to project those so that you can project. And, and really bottom line with a lot of this chapter is know your business right? Bottom line, know your business, no peak season, no down season, know your employees, know how much you have budgeted for those employees, um, that sort of thing. You, you need to know your business. You need to know what time your customers come into your establishment. And all of this is going to be important because in future classes, you're going to be developing a master schedule. You're going to be developing, believe it or not, you're going to have to develop a work schedule, a crew schedule for your establishment, which is why I'm kind of encouraging y'all, don't go hog wild with how many people you're putting in your organization at this stage, all right? Because down the road, you're going to have to be costing that out, all right? So keep that in mind. All right, so master schedule and budget, let's kind of whiz over into that real quick. 
the biggest thing I want you to look at is cross training. It is beneficial to cross train, right? You can have the same person come in and do multiple jobs less expensive than you can hire two people to do those same two jobs. Agree? Do y'all understand that? So cross training is very effective in operating and managing an, a, a, a corporation or whatever your establishment smoothly. Uh, coaching an employee to do tasks that are not normally part of his or her's position. Make sure you know, we've already had it, but make sure you know what cross training is. Now, again, in developing a crew schedule, guess what? Here's that word again, communication. You have to talk to your employees. You have to know if they're requesting time off. You have to know their vacation request, their day off request, and y'all can read through all of that. Um, the one thing I want you to flip over to page 164, make sure you highlight the Family and Medical Leave Act. There is legal provision providing it's a federal law that allows eligible employees to take off extended amount of time for medical and other personal reasons. I'm thinking of pregnancy, right? Uh, uh, most, well, not most, all businesses have to give you reasonable time off. That is a federal law. So you can read through that. Um, there's, you know, health conditions. There's um, care for, you know, if my husband, he's 74, what if he got sick and was in the hospital for a week or two? They, you have a, a corporation, you have to give your employees time off, but guess what? You have to communicate with your employees to know this, right? Absolutely. Um, employee absence policy. Now there are guidelines and procedures that explain how there's always, you can't just not show up. Just like technically, you can't just not be in class if I've deemed this class mandatory without a logistic excuse, okay? Uh, and there's proper protocols. Again, communication to follow that. Um, there's other scheduling concerns. Um, using employees efficiently. So how many of you work for a company that overworks you. Does anybody work for a company? Yeah, Latasha, Krista, they, they overwork you, right? They like have you on the schedule hours upon hours upon hours. So those are things you want to think about because what comes down with that comes stress, lack of performance, irritability, all right? So you want to adequately staff your master schedule and work it, work your wage, your crew schedule from that. But you also got to keep in mind your employees, right? So using employees effectively, and you can read that, building flexibility in the schedule. What happens if somebody calls in sick? They need to have that flexibility that they can stay out. They can go to that prompt care, take that child to prompt care, that you're not so reliant. Hey, puppy, puppy. Hey, Chitarius, puppy. That you're not so reliant on that employee that your operation can't function if they need a day off, right? There's a lot of uh, corporations that can't function without you, aren't they? Um, but, but they really need to build flexibility into that schedule. Now, if you look at the bottom of page 165, you're going to notice scheduling minors. Guess what? You, a 15 year old can work. I had my first job at 14. How old were you? Um, who am I going to pick on? Uh, Chateria, how old were you when you got your first job? Oh, um, I was turning 18. 18? Boy, you, you were, you had the lap of luxury, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks to there my mom. Go. There you go. You better appreciate whoever paid for you up until 18. <laughs> my mom. There you go. You better tell her you love her. Yeah, Latasha. 
I'm mom. Your your mom? <laughs> <laughs> oh, your mom. You're Chateria's mom. Oh yeah. <laughs> Word. I just put that two and two together. All right, I was giving you some kudos, mom. Yes, that's <laughs> mom. Oh, holy goodness. Well, man, you better be loving that mom because guess what? I couldn't buy my first name brand pair of blue jeans till I started waiting tables at the age of 14. Oh, 14. Lord. But that <laughs> Look, I grew up poor. <laughs> I grew up poor. Well, not no. I'm gonna take that back. I had, I I had a world of wealth, but at a young age, I didn't recognize that until I got older. You know, I had parents that loved me. I had food on the table, roof over my head. But uh, at 14, I wasn't happy because I couldn't have them name brand pair of blue jeans. <laughs> so I got a job. Uh, anybody else want to weigh in on that? Nope. Not like me, Chef. I uh, started, I was working at um, 14. Then I had two jobs by the time I was 16. But get this, with that working minor situation, I had to be hired as something else to work. And then like, you know, I was doing other yeah. stuff like waiting tables. Because we weren't supposed to be waiting tables at 16. So I had to be a hostess and then yeah. do the thing. Yeah. <laughs> But you know what? It, th this reminds me where there's a will, there's a way. And guess what? If you're, if, if you need money, there's a job somehow, some way that there, there, you can get a job somehow, some way. It may not be what you want, but you can get a job. So make sure you look at that because there, again, there is a fair labor standard act that involves in minors. All right. So make sure you look at that. Um, I mean, a 15 year old can work, but they have to, you know, meet those, uh, standards there. All right. Now paying overtime. Here's, uh, we all love overtime. Maybe, maybe not. Typically overtime, you get paid time and a half. If you work a holiday or weekend, you get uh, double pay. But now keep in mind, not all establishments do that. So don't give me that look, Krista. <laughs> not all. I'm sorry, chef. I'm trying to make me an egg sandwich this morning. Hey, who's going to bring me one, right? Uh, so, um, overtime pay refers to the number of hours worked over your regular 40 hours a week, okay? So don't get that confused. Make sure you know overtime does not kick in for anybody until you've worked over 40 hours a week. Now, you could work 10 hours on Monday, 10 hours on Tuesday, 10 hours on Wednesday, 10 hours on Thursday, but just because you worked over those eight hours each day don't mean you're getting time and a half because you haven't worked 40 total hours, okay? So don't get confused with that. Now, planning fair and reasonable schedules. Yes, Latasha. The overtime pay is the same as premium pay. Do what? Overtime pay day is the same as premium pay. Yeah, it, it, it can be called multiple things. It, anything that I, I don't care what they're calling it, anything that you're working over. Now, your company may call it premium. Um, if, if it's time and a half, it's overtime pay. If it's a uh, double pay, then it's typically called weekend holiday pay. Okay. You're, okay. you're working when, when nobody else wants to. I know in hospitals, you get a pay differential uh, because you work nights. You're willing to work them, them graveyard shifts when nobody else. So they'll, they'll give you more dollars for that. So yeah, it, and it can be called different things. Okay. All right. Now, you can read into more about uh, crew schedules and they have another example there. Y'all look at these examples because you're eventually going to have to create a schedule um, and you're going to have to be able to distribute and adjust the schedule accordingly based on what you need, when, who, how, why. So make sure you read into that. And then you're going to have to make sure that you, and I'm sorry guys, that's my computer. You have to make sure that you distribute that and um, you need to make sure that it's in different locations or it can be in the same location, but it needs to be in a prominent place where your employees can find it, 
okay? Who can tell me? Let's see, who, who hasn't participated here? Robert Swanson, are you still with us? Yeah. Good. Um, can you tell me what a contingency plan is? That's like something that's a plan for like when something go wrong or something like that. Perfect. Absolutely. Contingency plans are a plan in place for an emergency or a, a quick adjustment. And uh, they give you, they're on page 170, they give you ways that you can adjust in your contingency plan, okay? Again, a contingency plan is for emergencies or something unexpected that happens. In our personal lives, we need to have a contingency fund. Guess what? Your air conditioner may go out tomorrow or your refrigerator may quit. You need to have a contingency fund so that when something like that happens, you have the funds that you can make those repairs. Uh, 90 degrees outside, you can't live without that. Well, you can, but you're going to suffer living without that air conditioner, right? Um, you can't keep food cold without that refrigerator. So keep that in mind. Um, some ways that you can plan for that contingency is cross training. We've mentioned that already. Cross train your employees. If something happens where an employee hurts himself on the job and has to leave his position, you can put somebody else in there. You can't if you're not cross training, correct? Um, identify shift leaders. Make sure you know who's in charge, all right? They should be able to step in. Um, and then using floaters. Floaters, in, in they're basically people that can bounce front of house, back of house, any position, whatever. They're floaters. Um, or they may be someone that can fill in in different uh, um, franchises, different departments, different areas. So anyway, y'all can read more about that. Um, and I'm not going to go into those. They have a whole drawn out on each area as far as cross training, what you can do, identifying your leaders, and then using floaters. Know what floaters are, okay? You may or may not see that on a future test. Now, again, monitoring employees during the shift, you need to be making regular inspections, okay? You need to be going through your establishment. You need to make sure you know what's going on in your kitchen. You can't own and operate a business and stay home all the time. What do you think is going to happen to that business? RJ, what would happen if I owned and operated a business and I never stepped my foot in the door? Can you repeat that again, Chef? Um, if I owned or operated a business and I never stepped foot in the door, what do you think would happen to that business? Well, um, you never know what's going on. I mean, I don't know. Right. So next thing you know, um, you're losing money. Right. Correct. Okay. I got you. Uh, people, people are giving away food to their friends or, Hey, drinks are on the house, right? <laughs> Bottles yeah, okay. of liquor okay. disappearing. Okay. Um, so yeah, you have to be, you have to monitor what is going on. Now, a lineup meeting, I think every establishment, this is kind of like us having lineup before we go in the kitchen. You need to know what's going on. You need to know what's expected. You need to, it, it's a brief training. What's, what's going to happen that day? How many, how many, um, reservations do you have? So, so that's a good thing to have again. This helps you communicate with your staff, your employees, so that they're on the set. Hey, we're running a special today, $6.99 for that buffet. You know, your employees know, your front of house knows that there may be more people coming in and, and what's going on. They're not caught blindsided, all right? Now, the other thing you need to look at is variance. Um, we've covered variants several times, uh, within marketing and now within management here, a variance is the difference between your goal and your, um, actual expense. Your budgeted goal is not met. The difference between the budgeted expense and the actual expense. So when you see the word variance, just know it's the difference between 
what you said or hope to get and what you actually get. Okay. Bottom line. Um, I'm not going to go into all the actual hours and budgeted hours. I think y'all can figure that out. If you have a problem with that, definitely contact me behind the scenes. Okay. All right. Now, uh, work schedules for managers. You have to have manager schedules, just like you have to have crew schedules. And typically most establishments are going to have a manager on duty at all times. All right. In the food industry, you have to have a surf safe manager on duty at all times, all right, in the food industry. So again, I'm not gonna read through all of this. Um, you need to read through it. Make sure you understand some of the criteria that need to be met for a manager on duty, okay? Um, and, and it can include on-call managers. Make sure you keep that in mind. Um, and again, it says there, at least one manager on duty whenever an employee are working in an establishment. I just said that. So make sure you read through that. All right. That leaves us with chapter six. Does anybody have any questions on chapter six on schedules or hourly versus salary or compensation packages or fringe benefits? Um, Anybody got any questions or did I cover it in detail? <laughs> no questions, Chef. Yes. No questions or yes question? We're good. All right. We're going to move on then. All right. Let's move on. All right. All right. Uh, chapter seven, you have to manage daily operations. All right. Again, I have a note here not enough training that is important guys you need to plan training in your budget for your employees a trained employee is going to be a more effective employee they're going to produce more efficiently therefore increase your bottom dollars so uh, make sure when you start up, if uh, down the road your dream becomes a reality, I'm going to encourage you, train, 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 train. Yes, it costs money, but it's going to save and increase you in the end. Um, let's talk about preventive maintenance, okay? These are things that managers need to pay attention to, and, and this whole chapter is for you to identify what areas you need to take care of to help your establishment be successful and to help your employees be successful. And one of those is preventive maintenance. Who's got an idea of what preventive maintenance is? What, what are some things? Patrice? We used to do, uh, we used to do that in the military every Monday. So it depends on your area you would have, you know, vehicles that you would have to check to make sure, um, you know, a drip pan was under, or you just check your equipment, see if there's anything that's missing, broken, and you have to report it or write it down, take notes so it can be fixed. Absolutely, absolutely. That is preventive maintenance. Some, I mean, pest control. Let's think about pest control in a food establishment. If you don't follow through with preventive maintenance with pest control, you may have unwanted guests in your food and you don't want that to happen. Um, you, your exhaust fan, okay? Y'all been in the labs here. You've seen, you know, these exhaust fans, they're upwards 13, 20, $25,000. They have to have preventive maintenance. Yes, you guys deep clean. You take those little vents down and you clean them. But they have to have professionals that come in and clean up inside those. And a lot of establishments, especially in, a, in, well, in most areas, they have grease traps that have to have the grease cleaned out of them. Or you're going to have backups. And you know from Safe, when you start having backups in a kitchen, that can shut you down. So there's preventive maintenance that has to be done. And you as a manager, you're responsible for that so that your establishment and your employees can continue to work effectively. So understand that. Know what preventive maintenance is. It's to keep things in good working order. Um, and then you need to set priorities, okay? 
a lot of managers, you, you're going to get bombarded with tasks and things that start mounting on your plate from the time you walk in the door to the time you, you leave that day. So you've got to set priorities, okay? you got to know what is the most important thing to take care of. And you got to give priority to the ta to the tasks that are very important, the ones that are urgent, the ones that need you to stop right then and there and take care of those. Um, the, and then you're going to work on tasks that are important, but they're not urgent. Okay, they're things you need to handle probably within the next few hours or that day, but you don't need to stop what you're doing. And then the ones that aren't important. You need to make sure that you go back and, and you take care of those. And then at the end, you're going to handle the tasks that aren't important or urgent, but they still need to be taken care of. You can't just, if you will, um, push it under the rug and forget about it. Okay. And, and I've been in a lot of uh, different kitchens now with the school and, and I know even my own life, you have to be, on top of your priority list all right you have to to definitely create it compartmentalize it and take care of it all right now developing operating tools policies who can tell me let's see who hasn't chimed in yet um <clears throat> Shateria, do you know what a sop is um you said an SOP? Yes, ma'am. Standard operators. Procedure. No, I don't know what that is. Okay, thank you for whoever helped her out. Yeah, SOPs are standard operating procedures. In most establishments, you're going to have SOPs. Mm. You're going to have policies in place to handle things. That's what Helms is working on right now is a standard policy on how we're going to handle bringing you guys back. What if something happens? We need to know. We need to have a policy in place. We need to have a procedure. Just like if somebody cuts themselves here, we have a procedure. There are things and protocols in place to handle that. I know who to call or who not to call, right? We, we need to know that. When you leave your kids at home, you leave them with a policy of, this is what you do if this happens. Call me. <laughs> That's bottom line. You, you, it's as simple as that, but you have a policy in place. So policies are planned course of action. Please make sure you know that. You may or may not see that on a test, but policies are planned course of action. All right. They help you manage um, or the, they provide a strategy or help you manage um, an activity that may arise, okay? Competitive bids. Now, competitive bids basically involve requesting prices from different people so that you can, you know, you can determine who you want to go with. So that's a competitive bid. Usually uh, vendors, you're going to get competitive bids from your vendors or your purveyors, okay? Um, so I'll leave that where it's at. You, you should understand that. Policies connect the establishment's mission to its daily operation. Your policies need to be in line with your operation. You're not going to have a policy for an automobile industry uh, business if you're in the food industry. So make sure your policies are in line with where you're at. Now, you can read through some of them developing the basics of a policy. Um, and the one thing I want to point out with some of that is you need to know the policy that you develop, how it impacts other departments, okay? If you put a policy in place for front of house, how is that gonna impact back of house or vice versa? Make sure you understand how it impacts um, different departments within your establishment. And then keep them current. Don't have a policy for something that you don't even have anymore, right? That would kind of be crazy. So make sure you do that. SOPs, I just went through that. Um, SOPs are a list of steps that tell you how to perform tasks, things that you need to do. Standardized recipes. Um, uh, Bradley, what's a standardized recipe? Bradley, you still here? Yeah, I'm still here. 
What what's the standardized recipe? I mean, it's like it's a it's a recipe that's always gonna remain the same. Like, Absolutely. And and why why do we use standardized recipes? So you get the same results every time. Every time it minimizes errors, right? That was on your quiz. Perfect. Perfect. So make sure you know what standardized recipes are and why we have them. Task analysis is a process to identify tasks in a position, such as a cook or server. And procedure, y'all are going to be doing job descriptions. Really, this is kind of falls in line with that. This is what is the task that person's supposed to do? What is what is expected of that individual? Okay, and then you can actually create task lists. I don't I don't think I really need to get into that. That's going to tell you in this position what you need to do, what your tasks are in this position. Okay, and you can read some of those at home. They have some for the Deterra Cafe there. Uh, position task. That's going to be pretty much the same as your job responsibilities. Okay. Um, task breakdowns. Again, I don't think I need to go through all of that. Suggestive selling. Um, I'll briefly, because we are approaching, um, well, about an hour and 20 minutes here. Um, suggestive selling. Remember, suggestive selling is when your server is um, suggesting something with, hey, would you like a glass of wine with your appetizer? Would you like fries with that? McDonald's coined that term, right? Would you like fries with that? Um, I think it was McDonald's. Y'all can correct me later if I'm wrong. But suggestive selling is when you're suggesting something else to companion with, right? It's encouraging a guest to order um, products or services they weren't intending to order. Dessert, they may not walk in with dessert in mind, but they get a dessert. Um, they give you an example of a standard operating procedure. Make sure you take a look at that. Um, they also have how you can resolve operating procedure problems there. And I'm on page 190 going into 191 um, from defining the problem all the way through documenting what changes you implemented, what did you do, analyzing it. Make sure you know that problem solving model, all right? Define the problem, determine the cause, determine and analyze, analyze a solution alternative, select the best solution, develop an action plan, implement the plan, evaluate the results, and then document it. Make sure you know that, that, um, that model there, okay? And I'm not gonna go into each one of those. I think you can read that. They help you with, um, you know, going through that, asking the right questions, how you should approach that, and coming up with the right answer. Um, the one thing I want to keep in mind to you guys is a good manager can delegate. Don't think the managerial responsibilities, while you have them, you can delegate some info finding fact finding different, you can delegate some of the things that you need done to others, right? So make sure you make use of that. You don't have to weigh the, well, you, let me rephrase that because y'all are going to be like, yeah, a manager is on your shoulders, but you can delegate to responsible employees some tasks, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, there you go. So problem solving and daily operations. Make sure you read that because in every operation, these are some ways that you can problem solve some of the issues that's going to arise. Um, and remember, managers have to report to upper level managers, right? I report to Chef Dahl. Chef Dahl reports to Chef Bossenberg. So you want to have daily logs. You want to jot down what goes on. You want to record your information of different things and activities that are going on so that when you get ready to create that report, you've got information on hand, all right? Um, unusual changes in your menus, you, unusual events, employer customer accidents. Guess what? There's a SOP. There's a policy for an accident. 
you have to document it, you have to report it to upper management. There's always a protocol for most things. And as a new establishment, here's my takeaway. As a new establishment, you're not just gonna open the doors and at whim start operating. You're gonna have these policies, SOPs, you're gonna have all this stuff in place or you should to be effective, right? Y'all agree with that? Um, a, a subpoena, who can tell me what a subpoena is? How many of you, I, let me rephrase that, how many of you have been subpoenaed before? You have, yeah. I, I have it. So what is a subpoena, Latasha? Um, the order to show. Yep, pretty much. Legal notice that requires certain documents to be provided to a court of law. Um, subpoena means you're showing up. All right, they can subpoena you to be um, a wit, uh, not a witness, but a jury member. They can subpoena you to court if you've got a traffic violation. They can subpoena you for anything that uh, that the court or the law system wants to subpoena you for. So know what a subpoena is. You may or may not see that down the road. Um, the other thing, critical incidents. I, the, the biggest thing is I want you to highlight the purpose of a manager's log is to record critical incidents. Yes, it records many other things, but you must record accidents in your establishment not only for upper management, but also for um, insurance purposes and, and things of that nature. Accidents, incidents, emergencies, food problems. There's a whole host of things, depending on some of the foods that you have, that you have to record, okay? Um, we're gonna move on to planning for an emergency. Emergency is anything that's unexpected, all right? You need to make sure you plan for those emergencies. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, um, but there are a preventable types of emergencies. Emergencies can be preventable or unpreventable, okay? A preventable emergency is one that may be prevented from happening. You can prevent fires by making sure your establishment is up to code, right? You can prevent fires by making sure you have the proper equipment maintained and, and things of that nature, making sure you're being responsible. Unpreventable or ones that you can't prevent. Like if a tornado comes through, there's nothing you're gonna do about it. Your building's gonna blow down potentially. Um, so know the difference between those two and know that you have to have a written plan in place for emergencies. Every establishment is required to have an exit plan, right? Yeah, everywhere you go, you see little exit plans if there's a fire. Um, that, that's your evacuation plan. So make sure you're aware of what that is. And make sure you know the contact list. If there's a fire, who are you going to call? Who are you going to call? You're not going to call Ghostbusters, right? Ghostbusters. <laughs> exactly. You're not going to call Ghostbusters for a fire. So make sure you know who you're going to call. Uh, make sure you have a contact list. Uh, make sure you have a media policy. How many of you think about a media policy? You don't want, if there's a foodborne illness breakout in your establishment, how many of you want everybody, all your employees to start talking to the press? Oh my God, that would be a nightmare. Your, your business is done, okay? It's done. But if you have a media policy in place, you have someone who can constructively convey the outbreak without blowing it out of proportion, you may be able to salvage your establishment. You, obviously, you're gonna be shut down for a while. Obviously, you, you've got some, some cleanup work to do, but you may not have your total reputation tarnished. And, and when you're in the food industry, all it takes is one person to say they got sick in your establishment, right? And you're done. So, you know, media policies are important. Um, you can read there more about policies and paperwork, but as for today, that brings us to the end of chapter seven. Um, I do want to remind y'all, quiz one is open. It is available. You need to get that turned in today by 10 o'clock tonight. I will turn it off at 10. 
um, and I will debate based on individual circumstances if I allow you to make a quiz up or not. Um, there should be no reason why you shouldn't get that done. Um, hopefully, I'm fixing to start grading. So hopefully everything that was due yesterday is in. Again, if it's not, I may or may not allow you to make that up, um, depending on your circumstances and your communication with me. Does anybody have any other questions about today's lessons? I know we're, we're taking a long time, but we're covering two chapters at a time. Um, I really want y'all towards the tail end of, of this course to concentrate on those projects. And, and I really do hope some of y'all will decide to do a presentation and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll thought process maybe the extra credits. I think that's a great idea. Um, I'll, I'll determine how much that's going to be on your final grade or how I'm going to apply that. So any questions? Nope. Everybody good? Yes, Patrice. Oh, no. oh. Could you um could you repeat what we we spoke about with the presentation briefly? Because I don't think everybody heard. Thank you. Okay. So what um what I was bouncing was typically if you were in the classroom, you would be presenting your PowerPoint to the class. That would be your presentation of your final project. Um, we, I did not even go that route with the last class, basically because we were really trying to navigate the newness of Moodle and everything going on. But I think you guys have really got, uh, got the whole thing of life size. And I wanted to give each of you the opportunity of presenting your project via life size. In other words, the last, or, or not the last day, but the day that your final projects do, I will give you 10 minutes. And of course, we're all here together. You can present, be in uniform, all right? Completely decked out in uniform. Obviously, I'm not gonna see your pants or your shoes, but if you're in uniform, all right, and you want to present your project. Now, you don't have to have the PowerPoint showing. If you want to, that's fine. But if you want to present your PowerPoint to us, then I am going to figure out how to give you extra credit for that. Now, this is optional, all right? It will be for extra credit. You can submit your final project as you did last course in PDF form, you know, printing your slides out um, if you wish, and, and you will get, you know, your typical final project um, grade for that. All right, so that's, that's uh, one thing that um, I'm throwing out there. If you wanna do a presentation, do it, and you'll get extra points for it. Okay, um, since we're on the topic of, of projects just to be clear you need to make sure you're putting your journals in combination with your final project so make sure if it says like today okay um job descriptions all right make sure you're reading job descriptions on your journal but you're also reading what's required for that job description on the final project page because you've got to have two job descriptions, one front of house, one back of house. So make sure you're referencing both of these when you're getting your information together. On your final project, many of you did turn in um, your information for your fantasy project, but nobody had a cover page. That's why you're turning it in, so I can send you reminders. All right, journals are simply for me to give you my feedback. But when you get ready to set up your final project, where it says slide one, slide one can be your cover page, and then go into slide two being your description of your fantasy project, slide three being your mission statement, slide four being your organizational chart. You get my drift? I wanna see it in order, all right? I don't want you to have your job advertisement at the top behind your cover cover page okay um so make sure your slides are in order 
and make sure that your information is on that slide based on this final project list, all right? Nobody should be giving me a slide more than nine slides, okay? There should be no final project that has more than nine slides. One being the cover page. If y'all wanna write this down, feel free, grab a pen. Slide one is cover page. Slide two is your fantasy project. Slide three is your mission statement. Slide four is your organizational chart. Slide five should be your menu. Slide six should be your job descriptions. And I'm giving you slide six and seven for that because you've got front of house and back of house. Okay. Excuse me, Chef. Yes. I thought you changed it to 10 slides. No, it's it's nine. With the cover page, it should only be nine. Could you repeat but, um, those? Jane said you, you was gonna give us one more. I, I did, but that it took it from eight to nine. Could you repeat right. those pages? All right, I'm gonna repeat them again. Everybody writing? All right, slide one should be your cover page. Slide two should be your description of your fantasy project. Make sure it includes all of those items, the type of operation, your location, the number of seats. That's the information I'm grading by right there. What's on this final project sheet is what I'm looking for. So slide two is your, your fantasy operation. Slide three is your mission statement. And you can add pictures, you can make it as, as floofy as you want, but I'm looking for that specific information. Slide three, your mission statement. Slide four should be your organizational chart. Slide five should be your menu. Okay. Now, I did reduce your menu from 15 items to 10. I will take 10 menu items instead of 15. All right, your next slide, all right, which would be six and seven, should be your job descriptions. One for front of house, one for back of house. Now, if you can create a slide and have your job descriptions front and back of house on one slide, that's fine. But I've allotted you two slides for your job descriptions. Okay? Because you got to have front of house, back of house. Question. Yes. I was doing the food truck, so how do I, how do I go about Same it? way. Your food truck, you're still going to have an owner, and you're gonna have an assistant of some sort. So that's two job positions, two job descriptions. Okay. One of them can be somebody who takes the money and, and uh, that would be your front of house, your cashier person. Okay. So kind of kind of use your imagination and divvy up whatever your operation is to include front of house, back of house, okay? All right, so that's six and seven job descriptions. Slide eight should be your interview questions. Now, you're gonna pick one of, one of your two job descriptions, and you're gonna create interview questions for that job, for that job, okay? So you've got two job descriptions. You're going to create an advertisement and interview questions for one of those positions. Is that clear? All right, so slide eight is going to be your interview questions for that position. And then slide nine is going to be a job advertisement for that position. So you should only be turning in to me no more than nine slides. In your power. So for clarity, Chef, um, basically all we're doing is adding the cover page slide and just bumping everything else down. Correct. Correct. Okay. And and the cover page is simply your name, the the course, my name as the instructor. Now, I mean, if you want to make it floofy and add image, go ahead. If you want to put your logo on there, go ahead. 
Um, I had posted and emailed um, a copy of my report, my project I did in marketing, I think it was. Go back and take a look at that. I had a cover page and, and went on down. I think I had the job descriptions, the organize. Well, maybe that, maybe I sent y'all that for marketing, but technically it was my management report or project. All right, any other questions? Everybody good. All right. I want to thank everybody for joining me today. And, and remember, if you need to go back and review any of these virtual classes, I am posting them up on YouTube. So if you feel like you missed any information or, or something's not quite clear, go back and check that out. You can rewatch it on YouTube. Okay. I sent y'all the link. Any other questions? Nope. No raised hands. All right. Thank you, everybody. It was nice seeing you, and I'll see y'all tomorrow. Bye-bye. Have a good day, Chef. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.